Welcome back to Distributed Tracing in Next.js. This is lesson 2, where we're going to dive deeper into distributed tracing and learn how it works under the hood. So let's jump right in. Here's a diagram of all the bits and pieces that make distributed tracing. Let's start with the largest piece, the trace. What is a trace? A trace is a log of events that occurred during a program's execution. It's like a chain of operations that happened during a certain task. A single task is described by a single trace. It can be a page load event started by the browser or a specific flow that a user is experiencing in your application, like a checkout flow. When a trace gets created, it's uniquely identified with a UUID. We call that ID the trace identifier. Then we have transactions. Traces are composed of multiple transactions. For each part in your application, for example, the front end, the back end, the database, a transaction is being created. A transaction describes the operations that happen within the entity where it's created. Let's say the API handler on the backend. It starts when the HTTP request reaches the backend, and then it ends when we return the HTTP result back to the client. Each transaction contains at least one span. And what is a span? Let's zoom in on the second service here. Spans are the atomic unit of work, like individual resources being loaded, UI component lifecycle events, file I.O. operations, requests made to external services, etc. Because a transaction has a tree structure, top-level spans can be broken down into smaller spans, mirroring the way that one function may call a number of other smaller functions. Looking at this picture, we can see that the root span has three child spans, which could be three different functions that are being called. Those three functions call four more functions, which they too call a couple of other functions. That's a span, an atomic unit of work, a single function call. Spans that make a request to an external service start another transaction on that service, if it's instrumented by you. And just like the trace, each span needs to be identified with a span identifier as well. Similarly done by creating a UUID when the span begins its operation. Let's see a real world example. Here's an example of a page load event that gets triggered by the browser when a user lands on the page. The first service is the browser. Aside from the rendering, the browser sends an API call to the backend to obtain the page's data in JSON format. The backend, in order to get the data, sends a query to the database server, and then everything unfolds. The database returns the data to the backend, and the backend puts it into a JSON format and returns it to the page. We had three services in play the browser, the backend, and the database. And we had transactions for each of them. Okay, so we've learned what a trace is and what it consists of. But how do we make it distributed? To do that, our application must propagate the trace context between the transactions. The trace context holds three values. The trace identifier, the parent identifier, which is the span identifier of the parent span that spawned the current transaction, and the sampled value. The sampled value can be no value at all, which means defer, zero means don't sample, and one means sampled. By passing the trace context, our services know which trace they should append their transactions and child spans to. And this is how distributed tracing works under the hood. And that's it for this lesson. Don't forget to check out all the resources down in the description below. Like and subscribe, and go check out the next video in the series. Thanks for watching.